Hey folks, uh, I'm Joel Haskard, co-director of the Clean Energy Resource Teams, or CERTs, and I want to welcome everybody to session two of our Energy Future series, Conversations on Where We're Headed. Uh, in this second part of the series, we'll be exploring solutions to energy poverty in one neighborhood in Duluth, the pros and cons of that model and how it might translate to other areas. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about this series. Uh, we're hoping to hold up different perspectives on varying aspects of Minnesota's changing energy path, expose people to divergent ideas about where we're headed, uh, hopefully go beyond superficial talking points to learn more about the potential considerations and implications and consequences of moving in a particular direction, and also model civil conversations around areas of disagreement, if such disagreements occur. <laughs> Uh, the format today, we're going to try to stick to 45 minutes. Um, we're going to have a lead share. It's going to be Jody, who will be interviewed by a CERTS team member. That's going to be me. And this will be conversational. It's not a PowerPoint or a, kind of a slide presentation. And then we're going to bring in a couple of additional guests to join the discussion to reflect on questions that the shares ideas elicited from them. Uh, so then we will dig into a few of those questions and then also we're gonna have some questions from you folks as well joining us today. And the entire segment's gonna be moderated, but then we'll also follow up with a recording and a write-up of the speaker's responses. So there will be a follow-up after this. Um, so uh, today's featured share is Jody Slick. She's the founder and CEO of Equilibrium 3. Uh, Equilibrium 3's mission is to lead and inspire change towards an equitable and sustainable future. And they accomplish this mission through two areas of focus. Uh, the first is serving as the neighborhood convening organization in Duluth's low-income Lincoln Park neighborhood, working on all aspects of sustainable revitalization that advance opportunities for residents and businesses. Uh, the second focus is for community sustainability and resiliency, including aspects of energy transition, housing stock improvement, economic security, and health. So, hey, Jody, welcome. <laughs> so, <laughs> welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so I just read Equilibrium 3's mission statement. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, how the organization came about? Sure. Um, Equilibrium 3 is actually a spin off um, from a former social enterprise uh, that I also founded called Common Ground Construction. Uh, we started um, that enterprise back in 2004, really to look at how we can do things like deconstruction and job training for low income individuals as the public housing project was coming down. Um, over the years, there were some tax changes, et cetera. And so um, uh, Common Ground Deconstruction Services and Reuse Center <laughs> um, actually uh, moved more into green affordable housing construction for our parent land trust. Um, and really while doing that work, we ran into a few things that were, were kind of frustrating. Um, when we looked at energy poverty in our community, as an example, uh, we were able to successfully, uh, for example, apply for some uh, green uh, affordable housing dollars so that we could add at the time um, some uh, solar hot water onto 10 buildings. Um, and as, as much as that was kind of a nice demonstration project, the reality was instead of having $25,000 for 10 buildings um, to put some solar hot water on, um, it made more sense for us to figure out how could we spend $2,500 on a thousand, or excuse me, on a hundred buildings um, in order uh, to really get kind of the best return on investment. And so um, over time, our parent nonprofit merged with another one, and we actually took the green affordable housing construction company, left affordable housing with them, um, uh, the construction portion, and we took a lot of our economic um, and environmental development work and formed um, our own nonprofit, uh, Equilibrium 3. Fantastic. So, so around 2004 is when you were kind of started in this. Is that about right? Yep. 
Yeah. Yep, 2004 yeah. with with Common Ground, and then in 2011 uh, is when we made our our kind of uh, final split. And and by that time, we had already uh, created the Duluth Energy Efficiency Program, uh, which was really a community scale program uh, that's gone through different iterations as uh, uh, society has kind of changed around us. Um, in our community, everything from uh, the epic floods of 2012. Um, to uh, it, it kind of started with some stimulus dollars, um, and then uh, initially it was focused on uh, job uh, availability. You know, keeping our contractors employed during the economic downturn, and then contractors got uber busy. So, how did we continue to offer services and deal with um, the weatherization needs and energy efficiency needs, especially of our low-income populations, um, when contractors aren't necessarily interested in doing a, a, a very very small um, project. So now um, our energy efficiency work uh, really actually focuses on, on working with community volunteers, um, uh, training them, working with our, our energy auditor, uh, our AmeriCorps VISTA program, et cetera, and going in and helping uh, elderly, low-income, disabled, and veteran households uh, get some of those initial weatherization um, pieces done uh, because we know that our, our low-income weatherization programs just don't have enough resources uh, to meet all of the needs of people that are living in poverty. Absolutely. So, the, Jody, this is great. So tell me, you know, I understand some of the pieces that you just described. Can you tell us a little bit more about just your overall, we know the mission, we've heard some of what you're doing, but what is your vision when you're, when you step back and think or your theory of change or philosophy, whatever you want to, whatever you want to come up there. <laughs> um, I think the most basic theory of change um, that we operate under uh, at Equilibrium 3 uh, is you don't have impact unless you get something done. Um, and that uh, may seem uh, to be a very uh, uh, kind of uh, no-brainer statement, but we all know in the land of, of work and nonprofits and community work, et cetera, there are a lot of things like meetings and grant writing and all of that that, that needs to happen. Um, where I think uh, our program uh, uh, has been very successful is in um, using some different models, uh, like kind of that third party uh, project management models, some of those things uh, to really better understand um, kind of what the current landscape is, what the challenges are, what stops people. Um, from doing things that make a lot of sense and are actually going to pay them back. Um, and then putting kind of the wraparound program to get people um, past the idea of just knowing uh, that they, they should do um, investments in their home or they should make behavioral change and actually doing it. Um, and, and that's really, we've been using really design thinking um, and we, we also actually work um, uh, from a design thinking point of view with our community, not only on things like energy efficiency, um, but on some solar projects we've worked on uh, and on things like housing and how do we uh, use vacant lots in our community? How do we address um, food access problems? How do we deal with health challenges, digital divide, all of those type of things? And let's let's. That's great. And let's talk about, you know, let's talk about the neighborhood. I mean, Equilibrium 3 has a wide range of projects and programs. There's a, many things that affect the entire city of Duluth, but Lincoln Park is where you're physically located, your office, and it's <laughs> it's really where you've really honed in on this neighborhood. Can you tell us more just about the community and the neighborhood of Lincoln Park? Sure. So um, uh, yeah, we're physically here, and, and I thought you were going to say that's where our heart is, because it, it really is um, what we consider yes. our neighborhood. And, and we, we when we um, formed Equilibrium 3, we intentionally um, moved from downtown um, to the Lincoln Park neighborhood. And that, that comes um, because of our philosophy that if, we, if we're truly going to have um, just an equitable advancement in our community, you start by putting the most capacity in those places that are facing some of the largest challenges. And so um, we often talk about the Lincoln Park neighborhood. It's about 6,000 residents. Um, we, we talk about it really as kind of a tale of two cities. 
Um, oftentimes, um, nonprofits uh, and, and community members um, see all of the negatives, and there are plenty of negatives and challenges that this neighborhood has. Uh, the census track, for example, um, that I'm sitting in right now, we actually have a 20-year life expectancy disparity um, compared to other census tracts in this community, meaning that our residents are dying on average 20 years earlier. That, you know, is something that, that needs to be, uh, dealt with and not, not just, um, in a, in a minor manner, but really bringing lots of capacity to. Um, we could look at, um, the economic disparity. We can look at the poverty. We can look at the educational disparities, et cetera. Um, but we also have a neighborhood, um, that when our residents are, are living on average, uh, on about $28,000 a year per household, um, that's really tough when we think about affordable housing challenges, when we think about energy poverty, et cetera. Um, but the residents themselves are hugely um, resist, resilient. They um, have such strengths. And, and this is a neighborhood that has such strengths. You can talk about all the deficits, or you could point out that a block from us is the state's oldest children's museum. Um, in this neighborhood is the most important por port on the Great Lakes. We um, are next to uh, the largest freshwater estuary in the world. You know, that's that's the shoreline uh, that makes up our neighborhood. Um, we have a maker space. How cool is that? Um, and a lot of people are familiar with Lincoln Park um, because uh, it, it's also an area that is revitalizing based on um, the the work of a lot of small businesses. Um, whether they be breweries, whether they be artisans, whether they be craftspeople, uh, et cetera. And so a lot of the work that Equilibrium 3 is involved in is that space between kind of this amazing um, energy and opportunity that this neighborhood can can produce um, or, is, or is that space that people are living in um, and all of those challenges. And how do we make sure that as this neighborhood faces um, what's going to be about seven years of being wrapped in heavy highway construction um, as we deal with things like uh, the pandemic, uh, as we deal with continued challenges um, that are just worsening for, because of the economic uh, crisis, uh, energy, cold climate, um, health challenges, all of those things. How do we make sure uh, that we get to that idea that um, uh, you know, a rising tide floats all boats and that that uh, the positive parts that are moving forward in the neighborhood don't cause things like um, displacement. How do we deal with that old housing stock um, and not in a manner that means the people who are living there right now don't benefit? Yeah. Well, that's great. Uh, so uh, how, when, you know, you're there in the community. How have you... Uh, What's your way of communicating or uh, organizing events or how are you getting input from businesses and residents there? What's what works? What doesn't work? What have you what are your you know successes, failures, any of that kind of stuff as you're trying to <laughs> make sure that you're representing you know, what the community wants and needs in your work, which sounds like you have a really strong belief in doing. Uh, how do you elicit that from a community? <laughs> Yeah, it, it, I think that's that's one of the the challenges um, that that any organization has, and I, I think has often been um, especially a challenge for environmental organizations because oftentimes environmental organizations have a much um, are, are, are much broader and they're not as deeply ingrained in one um, frontline community. So we do have an advantage. Um, we're the organization, for example, um, that runs the Main Street Lincoln Park program, you know, so we're working with um, all of the businesses. Uh, you know, we have somebody that sits on the, the, the school districts um, or our, our schools um, uh, parent community advisory board. Uh, we work, you know, very deeply with city government and utilities. Um, and residents um, and other nonprofit organizations. So, for example, um, one thing that Equilibrium uh, 3 had done uh, when the floods happened in, in 2012 is we actually rapidly retooled our Duluth Energy Efficiency Program to take the lead on flood recovery for households in the entire region. 
um, because we already had kind of a third party project management model. And when we didn't get individual federal assistance, we needed somebody to step up into that role um, to help individual households. Um, when we, we've now taken that experience from having to deal with disasters and, and spending a lot of time in this larger community resilience space um, to, to very rapidly respond um, to the COVID um, situation. And, and there, um, even... Pardon? I understand you did something with masks, like you made two or three masks. <laughs> What's the story there? Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we actually made um, uh, three really strong commitments even before we had any shutdowns. One is, is that we'd keep our neighborhood Fred because we, we do have a USDA um, food desert here. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of kind of gap filling, like when the school districts aren't, uh, the school district isn't providing food, et cetera. Um, we uh, made the commitment that uh, we would make sure that our residents and businesses were very uh, connected um, to the, the resources that they were going to need to not only um, survive this pandemic, but hopefully um, uh, thrive through it. And then the third thing is, is, is we really have taken a very strong um, stance as to what can we be doing um, to, to advance the health and wellness of our community, which is everything from really looking at how do we de-isolate people, um, because that's a huge um, portion when we think about mental health and when we think about winter coming and, and all of that stuff. Uh, but then also just how do we physically keep people safe? And so one project uh, that we launched with one of our, our neighborhood partnering businesses is we brought over a thousand um, volunteers together in, you know, socially distanced groups of 30 that were sat 20 feet apart. Um, in an indoor arena um, for, you know, a couple of months. Uh, and uh, those community members actually helped us assemble 226,000 face shields um, for frontline workers, um, because that's something that can be done, you know, in our case with a stapler. <laughs> um, uh, and that actually then allowed some of our local businesses in the neighborhood that have professional um, sewers to spend their time making masks. And then what we were able to do is actually distribute um, the masks, uh, which are what community members needed the most out in community, not only to allow the Boys and Girls Club, for example, to reopen um, or the Children's Museum um, or for different events to be held, um, but we also then were able to distribute thousands of masks when we had things like George Floyd uh, protests, not only up here, but we actually um, sent thousands down to the city to, to help keep neighborhoods and, and individuals um, safe. And it's, it's the fact that we have so many partnerships um, in community that, that allows us to, to maybe be in a little bit more of an innovative space um, uh, because we kind of have some credibility with the guy, honestly, that stands in line for the bar across the street at 8 a.m., you know, all the way up to some amazing partnerships we've been able to have over time with state agencies um, and federal agencies. Um, and that informs a lot of, of what we think are, is some of the essential secret sauce, I guess, um, to, to where and how we need to, to move um, together as we think about things like a just transition. That's what, you know, we're all clean energy geeks on this, this, this particular <laughs> event. So, but I had to be like, tell us about the masks. Cause that's a really, <laughs> that's a pretty amazing story, Jody. So good on you. Oh. oh yeah. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> well, Hey, so, okay. Pivot back to Lincoln park, pivot back to clean energy. I wanted to ask you, I'm going to ask you a, about a specific project, if it's okay about the solar project that you're working on there. Sure. And then I, I do have a question keyed up is, where do you think we're heading on clean energy? What resources and models do you think will drive development in the future? So I'm hoping you can give me a specific, you know, tell us about the Lincoln Park project, the solar project, and then and then yeah. uh, tell us about, you know, clean energy. What, what do you think, Jody? What's, what's shaking <laughs> thing? Where's it going? Yeah, a, a couple of things. First of all, we've been um, uh, really excited, and tomorrow we'll actually be having a celebration um, uh, uh, for uh, the completion of the Lincoln Park Solar Garden. And um, it's a 40-kilowatt ar array that is um, all benefiting low-income um, individuals in our community. And um, we 
like to, whenever possible, uh, kind of overlap our various programs. And so where this array is, is uh, um, a right along I-35 and will actually serve as a new entrance to the Lincoln Park neighborhood. Uh, the power from the array is actually um, going to have two different benefits. Um, uh, the first benefit is, is it's actually seeding an emergency energy fund that Equilibrium 3 will run. Uh, and what that does will is will provide some emergency funds to help uh, families that are facing um, utility disconnection. Um, so by by being able to kind of help with with some resources at that point, uh, we accomplish two things. One, um, uh, in our community, if your utilities are disconnected, uh, you actually can have your home condemned for human habitation, and that can can start a really really nasty um, spiral. And so it's it's a way to help keep people in their homes. But when we help them in that period, that that kind of a crisis point, uh, we also then uh, will work with that family to help them long term. Uh, by by enrolling them in our Giving Comfort at Home program. So we can look at um, how they can decrease their bills uh, moving forward. Um, and then they, the second thing is, is that a quarter of the, the, the power, um, and it's because of net metering, so it's not the actual electrons flowing. Some people uh, do ask about that. And with a bunch of energy geeks here, you guys might be those uh, type of people. But uh, uh what um, will happen is uh, a quarter of the, the value of the power that's generated uh, will actually be going to help the Minnesota Assistant Council of Veterans. Um, they have a, a place called the Duluth uh, Veterans Project, which is actually a project when we were common ground. Uh, we helped um, uh, renovate and build out. But that is a transitional housing project um, for homeless veterans. And so it's a way um, they they had a project and unfortunately it wasn't one in which the roof could support what they wanted to do on solar. And so this was a, a great way of, of kind of overlapping those things um, to be able to provide that that double benefit. Um, and for us, uh, you know, as a, as a uh, there, there are lots of places we may have been able to put that array, but uh, we love the idea that now as, as you drive into Duluth, because it's at, at kind of the Point of Rocks area, so right before you reach downtown, uh, you can now look over to the side and, and see this uh, lovely array. And, and we will then be um, working with uh, neighborhood residents um, to, to look at now kind of the art and the rest of the creative placemaking and education um, that will happen um, uh, at that site. And, and we've had some great partnerships over the years to help us think about that site, too, um, with uh, University of Minnesota, a couple of engineering professors there that are, are absolutely top notch. And I think maybe you have even served on their search committee. Hey, would you look at that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, and then Jody, what about that bigger, you know, I don't know if it's, you know, it could be energy efficiency, it could be renewable energy, but when you're looking oh, out yeah. five, ten <laughs> down the road, what are you thinking? Well, uh, you know, the way that we've always looked at our programs is we always look at it is, is that we need to figure out how do we apply the most capacity uh, to the individuals and in situations that need it most. So when we look at, at things moving forward and we think about transition and we think about some of the economic structures that have been created uh, to do things like investment tax credits to help people who already have, you know, some some means um, potentially to add solar, um, to put that on their homes, et cetera. And so what, what we really um, uh, feel that the conversation needs to be um, pivoting more and more to is is, is that um, we need to, to be developing those packages uh, that are going to allow uh, that clean energy um, and electrification to benefit um, those that, that are already um, uh, dealing the most with things like energy poverty. And, and that is, um, that's, that's a challenge because we do want to do things, for example, like uh, electrify transportation. Um, uh, you know, that's a good thing. If we're going to be dealing with carbon, we absolutely have to do that. But we need to recognize um, that that putting in that charging imp uh, infrastructure 
and in doing things like electric vehicles um, isn't necessarily going to be uh, beneficial to the, the the quarter of the households in my neighborhood that don't have access to any vehicle. It's going to be a long time before they move into the EV side. So always making sure that we're bringing that voice to the table, like what are we doing on the other strategies of, of enhancing um, uh, multimodal um, opportunities? What are we doing uh, to electrify public transportation? You know, what are we doing to, to explore the opportunity more of that kind of sharing economy? And those could be electric vehicles. Um, you know, those are the type of things that, that we have to keep um, that equity um, absolutely front and center. That's great. Yeah. So, okay, we've only got about a minute before I bring in a reactor speaker to what you've just talked about. So, so Jody, briefly, uh, this is where you're trying to punch holes through your own philosophy and vision. So, <laughs> I don't know how else to say. So for folks who might disagree with the idea or theory of change that you have, what do you think their major critiques might be? Um, <laughs> I I, I'm going to tell you one of my, I, 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 I can tell you one of my saddest moments. Um, and that was when uh, uh, we uh, were part of an EPA Climate Showcase Communities Project. Um, we, we led that here in Duluth to really look at multiple pathways um, to address carbon um, on the efficiency side. Uh, and uh, I remember doing our final report, um, and our program actually was, um, you know, awarded a seed, seed of change, how we were doing things um, using design thinking to get people from an energy audit to actually doing work. You know, nationally, about 2% of people that got an energy audit would do something with those results. We actually got that up to 65%. Um, and, uh, and it was actually that entire process that allowed us to pivot to do disaster recovery. Um, but I remember doing our final report for the EPA. We had completed like 326 weatherizations and all of that kind of stuff. And woohoo, congratulations, go us. And it made a difference because um, on average, households were saving over $600 a year. And, and it was just absolutely awesome. And then I took the cumulative impact of all of that and put it into the EPA carbon equivalency calculator. And it was like taking a coal-fired uh, power plant offline for four hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and, and so when I when I say that that we absolutely have to be thinking about that individual household um, and, and their survival and um, their comfort and and that it to me, that's absolutely important because we are the pieces of what is our society. Um, but uh, I don't say that that has to happen in exclusion to these other theories of change because we absolutely need people working on that um, policy side. We need people, um, you know, uh, not tilting at windmills, but tilting at, at uh, um, uh, coal-fired power plants and, <laughs> and those type of things. So um, that, that, that was the moment of ouch. Um, yes. But I know it matters. I, I And just to give the flip side of the personal story there, um, after we did that work, we actually had a 74-year-old man stop in our office one day and, and tell us that we had helped his mom. And she had passed. And um, he wanted to share a story that he had walked into her house one day. And um, he just looked at her. And she was in her 90s, of course. And he's like, Mom, it's warm in here. It had never, ever been warm in our house before because she was on fuel oil. And we were able to transition her onto, to at that time, natural gas and, and help her. And she just, he said, she smiled at me. She said, I know. But for 50 years, you know, she had not had her thermostat really up above about 58. And so um, absolutely, we need to be dealing and getting to that huge carbon reduction, but we also need um, to see and know those stories and, and understand that, that that one household mattered. Absolutely. That's a great way to end this part, Jody, and we'll bring you back in as we, as we have a couple other folks join us. Fantastic. Thank you, Jody. So now what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to pivot here. We're going to bring in two reactors and each will have a few minutes 
to share the reactions before we get into some of your, the audience's questions submitted in the chat box. Uh, so our first reactor is Mauricio Leon. He's the senior researcher at the Metropolitan Council. Hey, Mauricio. <laughs> uh, Mauricio, uh, the Met Council is looking at feasible and equitable ways for cities to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions over the next several decades. So the Met Council, you know, we're going from one neighborhood that we've been talking about to uh, multiple counties here. So this is from... This is from your regional or local government perspective, not just one neighborhood. Can you share your thoughts on this work of reducing greenhouse gases? Kind of what Jody was talking about is, you know, she knows the finite and getting that one house, but then you look at, oh my gosh, we have so much to do on such a big level. Yes, thank you, Joel. And thank you so much, Jody. I really uh, enjoy uh, your, your uh, presentation. I think there's some amazing work that is happening in Duluth and that we have a lot to learn from it. Um, I think that what is interesting to me is that I'm coming kind of from a different angle. We're both trying to accomplish the same thing. So we're both thinking about how we can build uh, more resilient communities, but coming from a different angle where we are actually looking at what needs to happen at the regional scale, at the uh, local government scale. So, Jody, your work sounds to me like you are um, actually working from the neighborhood level and um, influencing policy um, on higher scales. So that's that's really interesting to me, and that's definitely what I want to say. And I think that uh, one of the questions that uh, it's really important is how to arrive to decarbonization in a way that is equitable. So that is something that is not easy for us working in government. It requires constant uh, outreach and engagement to really know what is the uh, best way to go about this. So we are trying to explore ways in which we can reduce our greenhouse gas emissions as a region. But then the question is how to do that in a way that is equitable. It's, it, believe it or not, it can be a really challenging question. And I think the answer is in or kind of like the work that Jody is doing, you're accomplishing what we're hoping to do. So that is really wonderful to see. Um, I think that I, one, one uh, quote that you mentioned, Jody, that really resonated with me is, you don't have an impact unless you get something done. And I think about that because sometimes uh, when we work on the planning side of things, it's hard to see the impact. You know, it, it's kind of a long-term thing but when we see what groups like you are doing we find that inspiration to uh, continue your work so a little bit about me my name is uh, again mauricio i work for the metropolitan council and the metropolitan council has a community development division that has a research uh, unit in this research unit we are uh, looking at ways in which we can uh, using data we can identify the best strategies to decrease uh, greenhouse gas emissions, not only for the region, but also for local governments. So again, just really uh, inspired by the work that you guys are doing. And I think it's amazing work. And so thank you. Thank you. I That's great, Mauricio. We'll keep you on. We're going to keep you on the line for the conversation coming up. Thank you. Um, so, hey, next up, we're going to have uh, Jacob Manns is an assistant uh professor at the University of Minnesota School of Architecture in the College of Design. Uh, Jacob, you've done work with tribal nations and others getting community input and not just working with old existing housing stock, but creating new models and structures. It's kind of your work as an architect. Can you tell us more about what you see in the future of affordable housing? And I think also give folks a little bit of information of some of the projects you've done and are working on currently, which I, I think are super cool and fascinating. <laughs> Sure. Thanks, Joel. And uh, thanks, Jody, for the kind of very in interesting and um, inspiring presentation. As Joel mentioned, my name is Jacob Manns. I, uh, I'm an architect. I teach at the University of Minnesota. I'm an affiliate of the Minnesota Design Center. Um, and maybe that's where I want to start. So many of the ideas, <clears throat> the, the kind of neighborhood scaled um, design thinking reminds me a lot of the conversations that we have at the University of Minnesota in the Minnesota Design Center where Tom Fisher is running these conversations. Um, 
And one of the things that, that he talks a, a great deal about is leveraging community assets. So that's one thing that I picked up on the presentation that you gave. It's, it's not one project and like this is a solution. It's many different projects. It's everything from you know, protective devices in COVID-19 to kind of larger solar installations and providing, you know, electricity to community members all the way back to, you know, I was fascinated at the very beginning um, <clears throat> of the presentation, you know, when you were talking about deconstruction and like, you know, taking buildings down in a different way, which, you know, for an architect, you know, I'm very interested in construction and I wish that architects were thinking more about where buildings go after they're deconstructed because, you know, they end up impacting communities for decades or centuries to come. So, like, I, I think that there's just such a, a breadth in the different things that you were talking about your organization doing over time. And I can imagine you picking up on all these different assets um, and really trying to leverage them for the community. So that to me is it like shows a really you know, you're seeking resilience in the interventions that you're doing with the community, but you're a resilient design thinker because you're really kind of spreading your your um, uh, your capacity across a wide range to have a very large impact. Another thing that I think um, I would like to comment on is maybe the governance structure that you're trying to create between your organization, uh, regional and city officials in Duluth and the community. This seems to be one of the most important things. And this is something I picked up on doing work in Puerto Rico post Hurricane Maria. It was that communities who were affected by the storms and they, when, when designers or people were coming in to talk about energy transitions with those communities, there was not really a strong conversation about how the community would participate in the decisions that were made around whatever interventions were gonna be had on them, right? Like we're all trying to do good work. You know, the University of Minnesota is trying to do good work. You're trying to do good work. Search is trying to do good work. What is the process for, for engagement? Who is at the table when making decisions about how monies are spent? You know, and it feels to me like this neighborhood focus and the scale that you're operating at is really the, you know, that governance model is something that we need to work on designing. And I feel like, again, that's something that um, you were talking about doing in a really uh, robust way. And, you know, that's absolutely commendable. To talk about some of the work that we're doing, <clears throat> we, we've been doing work, um, on affordable housing on First Nations reserves in Canada. We're doing some work with the Opaspiak Cree Nation uh, in the PA, Manitoba. We're also doing work with Street Voices of Change in Minneapolis, looking at uh, extremely affordable housing for homeless communities uh, in the metro area. And, you know, one of the things that we recognize in the work that we do, and, and I think it shows in the work that you're doing as well, is that you know, we're looking to provide houses. As an architect, I design these things. I want to figure out ways to build them more affordably. I'm pro providing kind of a Band-Aid, you know, to a much bigger issue. And it's really these underlying systems that we need to take a look at trying to address. And that might be for me in my own work, overcoming colonialism or talking about systemic racism that certain communities have faced for generations that have economically disadvantaged them. And now, like, they're having issues with economic development with education and all of the kind of long-term systemic, you know, um, systems that I'm trying to solve through a house. It's not possible, right? That's not what we do. Like I, I can design a house, but a house doesn't solve the housing crisis. So for me, it's looking at the details of the details. It's not just the things that we produce, but the way that we produce them. And from, I see that in the work that you're talking about and the way that you're engaging with the community, it's the process. You know, and for me, it might be prefabrication and leveraging modular design and trying to work with communities to build their own shelters, to, you know, provide a house and at the same time provide a system where we can educate the community to become, you know, have better capacity at building something or, you know, be the people who actually get the economic advantage of money spent building housing. So I would say that the work that we're trying to do as it connects to the work that you're doing is really we've identified a set of solutions that we're trying to implement through housing. And we're really focused on the underlying systemic issues that cause the housing problem. And I think the big, the big um, thing that we're trying to figure out is how do we design governance models where we can actually do the appropriate kind of community engagement where the people who are getting the solutions that we're coming up with have a chance to inform their design. And they're actually, they have, a deci they have decision making power in that process. Um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there, but that's what I'm seeing in the work. I see this really strong neighborhood scale engagement that's trying to not only build local capacity, but provide an opportunity for the local community to have a, a voice and the decisions that are being made to improve their community. And that's really, really important, I think, 
as anybody who's doing energy transitions work and is talking about bringing in new infrastructure and technology, like we have to have that, um, that kind of community uh, capacity building and a governance structure that allows them to have a voice in those projects. Thank you, Jacob. I wanted to let folks know that in the chat box, you know, if you want to learn more about the decentralized design lab, we have links to that. If you'd like to know some more about what Mauricio was talking about with the Met Council's greenhouse gas inventory, we have links to that. Uh, we certainly have some more information about what Equilibrium 3 is doing. And we want to remind people that if they're ready and willing, there's a big uh, party happening tomorrow on the 22nd. And so everybody's invited. <laughs> virtually everybody's, virtually. Everybody's invited virtually, not virtually everybody's invited. That would mean I'm leaving somebody out. So, um, and we will also, when we um, kind of gather everything up from this session, we will have some of those links available for, for there as well, if you wanna look back at those. You know, one question uh, that came up and I wanted to, sh to, to kind of ask everybody uh, is, is that question of um, what are the pros and cons of having a nonprofit structure doing some of this work versus, for example, having the city of Duluth doing this? You know, how do those things, how do governmental and nonprofits work together or not, I guess, um, would be the, the way to ask that one. <laughs> Jody, I'll ask you, but then I'd also like to yeah. Jacob to I, get that as I well. I think it's a... Yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, it's it's much like uh, we can't um, subscribe to one theory of change and expect that we're going to solve the problems that we're we're collectively facing. Um, I, I think the advantage um, to a nonprofit is we have the ability to be more flexible. Um, you know, one of what what we've been able to do, we we often talk about it as our gray space successes. You know, when we think about um, an electric utility, their conservation improvement program is absolutely essential to our community. And, and our local utility, Minnesota Power, does a great job with that. Um, but they fit within a very regulated box for what they're able to do. Um, we've got Comfort Systems, which is our, our city's municipal gas utility. They're within a box. Um, the city government has certain things they can and can't do or have resources for or not have resources for. What a nonprofit can do is better understand that landscape and figure out sometimes when our role is to enhance something somebody else has done and other times where our role is, is to synthesize um, and, and create some, some new um, programmatic or project space that wouldn't exist without um, our ability to, to be flexible. Um, you know, I would suggest that, that being able to pull together um, basically a mini factory to assemble 226,000 face shields is a, a great example of how something that might be a little bit difficult for a government with all of its um, restrictions and barriers and millions of things that they have to pay attention to may not have been able to to accomplish. So it does absolutely take um, all of it, but perhaps I get to play in the most flexible um, sandbox when we think about uh, community and solutions. Mauricio, what do you think about that? <laughs> absolutely. I will second that uh, government is slow and a lot of what government does uh, sometimes it starts with nonprofit work. So I think that what nonprofits do, they stretch the um, boundaries of what government can do uh, or should do. And um, for example, the work that, uh, that Jody is doing should eventually also be something that is uh, more taken or more like done by the city. Um, but it has to start somewhere and I think that nonprofits are a great place, as you say, a great sandbox for this type of initiatives. Um, and, you know, like, for example, the work I do on climate and energy at the Met Council, we're always in constant communication with nonprofit groups because uh, the value is in the community. There's so much knowledge just here. Like it's, it's amazing how much knowledge there is on uh, racial equity, how much knowledge is on environmental justice, on energy and climate. And here in the Twin Cities, at least, you just, and I am sure in Duluth is the case as well, you just go and you just ask people who are experts and have like decades working on these topics and they will help you, they will reply to you because we all want to advance the same cause. And um, 
yeah, the, the only difference, yeah, being that government tends to be slow and tends to have constraints when it comes to what, you know, what is mandated or what is, you know, like allowed to happen uh, within the, you know, certain um, legislation or certain like mandates. So yes, absolutely, Jody, I second that. Jacob, do you have any, anything to add on that one? No, I mean, I think it's all been really well said. I mean, governments can and can't do certain things and nonprofits can and can't do certain things. And as Jody was saying, it's important that these things are, these different entities are able to communicate with each other and not duplicate effort. I mean, one of the, you know, like the worry would be that nonprofits start doing the work that government should be doing, right? And like the resources that people are paying into the government to supply services are like not, they're not getting their tax, um, they're not getting their benefit back from paying their taxes or something along those lines. So long as, you know, like that's not happening, I feel like the biggest concern would be making sure that, you know, the, the person who is best equipped in terms of like what constraints are on them is doing the work and that people are talking with each other, which it seems to be kind of like the, the goal behind uh, what Jody has been doing. Fantastic. So guys, I'm usually just crazy about keeping everything on time and we're at 344. So I know we're supposed to have one minute left, but I'm just dying to have like one last question. So super short, you know, your quickest words of wisdom. If somebody wanted to replicate your approach in their work or their place, um, you know, is there some resources besides the resources we're going to share from today, but do you have any words of wisdom or resources? And it's got to be like 40 seconds or 30 seconds, all your life's thoughts summarized in 30 seconds. <laughs> um, I I would just say that, uh, you know, I, I mentioned design thinking and something Jake, Jacob also talked about, you know, really the first step of that is is empathy and um, listening um, to your community, to the needs, to the fears, to the hopes, to the dreams, um, and then really figuring out um, from the perspective of members of your community, what the barriers are to get from where you're at to where you want to be. And that's the same as if we're talking about energy, uh, climate, um, housing, garbage in a lot, anything along those lines. Um, it really starts with that person to person uh, connection. And then all of the other systems um, can be can be built or can be focused um, on what you learn there. Thank you, Jody. Mauricio, that's a hard act to follow. Guys. Absolutely, I just, I just say, I, I, I really second that idea of design thinking and thinking that what we ought to be doing is connecting the dots. Uh, there's so much knowledge. There's so much knowledge in our community. What CERTS is doing, what Med Council is doing, what Jody and Equilibrium Tree are doing, uh, what Jacob is doing. It all connects. There's always gonna be some connection, and we ought to be collaborating. So yeah, design thinking for sure. I second that. Fantastic. Mauricio just stole all of my like first <laughs> comments. Um, I think one of the I think one of the really important things is, um, is that we're like working to to improve the planet too at some level, and that there's a very large scale thing that we're all kind of working to make resilient or sustainable. The the work that we're doing has a bigger goal than even the kind of neighborhood work that we're talking about today. And I think it is like we can tap into and we can have a bigger impact so long as we talk with people who are working at bigger scales. Like I would love, for example, for the conversations that are happening today, the projects that are being discussed to like be, ma be made available for people elsewhere who are trying to do similar kinds of work. So for me, it's like, how can I, even if I'm just building a small house for somebody, one house, like I want to understand how I can tap in to a system that is planetary in scale. Like I want to find a way to make my work have bigger meanings. And I think that's in what, Mauricio was saying with like, we need to be working to connect the dots. We can't be islands onto ourselves doing our own individual projects and not sharing the knowledge we're, we're gaining. So that would be my, my advice. I think like, let's find ways of connecting the dots. Let's find ways of framing this as a planetary project so that we're, you know, moving forward in the right direction. Man, that's a great way to end this. Uh, I really, really want to thank all three of you for joining today. So Jody and Mauricio and Jacob, thank you very much for for spending some time with us today. And just so folks know, we will kind of tie this up in a bow. We'll make sure everybody gets the recording and we'll try to get some of these links that have been shared in the chat box back to you. So you can uh, follow what's going on. Be sure if you can to uh, tune in to the event tomorrow, October 22nd with Equilibrium 3. That sounds like a big fun celebration. So 
Uh, on behalf of CERTS, thanks everybody for joining today and have a fantastic afternoon. Thanks, Joel. See you. Bye, you guys. Thank you.